Wow, it's wonderful to see all your glowing faces again. This beautiful fall morning in October. October is a great month, I think. Uh, this morning I asked Mark if we could upload some special slides to the PowerPoint. And I said, surely there must be some way we can do it. And Mark said, stop calling me Shirley. So, <laughs> so there's no special slides. I just made that. <laughs> so when I agreed to do this talk, I was wondering what topic I would discuss. So I was thinking about all sorts of topics. This seemed like the topics that really grabbed me, that really inspired me, were topics I'd already talked about. And I didn't want to just keep doing the same thing over and over again. So there I was, wondering what I was going to discuss today. And by seeming coincidence, as if there is such a thing, I was walking through public library, and this title jumped out at me, Super Joy learning to celebrate everyday life. And at first I just kept walking past the book. And then I stopped and I said, hey, I could use some super joy. That sounds pretty good. So I checked out the book. I brought it home and immediately ignored it for a week or two. And then when I did finally start reading it, I very soon saw that this is what I wanted to talk about, super joy. I'd never discussed super joy in front of all of you lovely people before. And so uh, the author, Paul Pearsall, PhD, is a clinical psychologist. And he knows that some of his clients have what he calls super joy. Super joy is this continually renewing, overflowing joy that some people have most of the time. They have it in good times and in bad times. And the super joy, it makes them very hardy. It makes them very resilient against life's ups and downs because this joy lifts them up in their difficulties just as it lifts them up in their, their not difficulties. I guess we could call their not difficulties their easies, right? It lifts them up in the midst of their easies and in the midst of their difficulties. We are expanding the English language today. So. <laughs> and also people who have super joy tend to be unusually healthy. It's been shown that a major shot of joy is one of the very best boosts to your immune system that exists in the world. This joy strengthens your body and strengthens your ability to resist illness. So, Dr. Pearsall starts with a case example. Now, he's changed the names in here, but he calls her Claire. So, at the time of writing, Claire was a woman over 60 who was a Holocaust survivor. She had been tortured. She had seen her parents and almost all of her relatives killed. And she'd spent most of the young years of her life living in the agony, the squalor, and the starvation of a prison camp. So by all rights, she should be weak, bitter, sick, and depressed. But instead, Claire is one of the most joyful women Dr. Pearsall ever saw. Claire's one of the most, one of the hardiest women he's ever seen. Everywhere she goes, people notice her. They notice the sense of aliveness and excitement that she brings with her. So Dr. Pearsall asked himself a question. Why is it, or rather, how is it that this woman radiates such spiritual strength when so many others had had their strength robbed from them? So he set out to investigate the answer to this question. So he studied Claire, and he also was able to find other people who had super joy, who were examples of super joy, and he studied those, and he found, lo and behold, that there are some commonalities between people who have super joy. But one of the things that came to his attention is that modern medicine can't really explain Claire and her 
extremely joyful spiritual nature because modern medicine focuses on what's wrong with you. If you are free from symptoms of illness, modern medicine declares you healthy. But if you were only to look at what's wrong with Claire, could you ever come to understand how she is this amazing, joyful person? No, you have to look at what's right with her. So, Dr. Pearsall proposes a new science, which he calls joyology. So maybe half of the title is starting to make sense now. Joyology, of course, is the study of joy, including super joy. And joyology focuses not on what's wrong with us, but on what's right with us. So one of the things that Dr. Pearsall found as he studied these joyful, these super joyful people, is that emotion often follows behavior. So we usually think that behavior follows emotion, right? So you experience the emotion of joy, and then you smile and laugh, and you become more animated. But he says it works just as well the other way around. Emotion follows behavior. So if you act in a joyful way, you feel joyful. If you smile a lot, you feel happier. I've tried this. It works. That's why you'll usually see me walking around like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I want to be happy. That makes sense, right? Yeah. And Dr. Pearsall recommends that we play children's games like um, jumping rope or jacks or any of those kinds of games because those bring us joy. However, there is a way we can mess it up. We mess it up if we play like an adult. So if we want to feel that joy, we need to learn to play like a child again. When children play, they, they play with freedom and abandon. They don't think, oh, I've got to retain my composure at all times, or what will people think of me? That, that's not what children think, no. They, they're just in the moment they're playing. In fact, Dr. Pearsall says that composure is one of the worst enemies of joy. Because in order to feel that super joy, we need to loosen up a little bit, let the feelings flow, let the joy flow. It's true that um, a lot of people have more difficulty expressing positive emotions like joy than negative emotions. Many people find it's easier to express emotions like anger or worry than it is to express positive emotions like joy or love. But we can work to help correct that. We can learn to talk more about joy to the people in our lives, to, to all the important people in our lives. And as it becomes a habit to talk more about our joyful experiences, we feel more joy. Kinda, kinda cool how that works. The great psychologist, Abraham Maslow, said, certainly is becoming more and more clear that what we call normal in psychology is really the psychopathology of the average. What we call normal in psychology is really the psychopathology of the average. So we, we can choose more than just to aim for what's considered normal. We can choose to aim for more than just being free from symptoms of illness. We can choose to be abnormally joyful. We can choose to be abnormally healthy. I like to think that I am a teacher by example when it comes to abnormality. I, <laughs> I'm leading the way, yeah, 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 yeah. So well, a lot of things that our society considers normal are, are really just things to prevent us from experiencing super joy. Yeah, there, I mean, there's always a, there's, there are certain times when you need to have our composure. There's other times when maybe it wouldn't be the end of the world if we just let loose a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 
one of the, well, actually the reason that Claire went to Dr. Pearsall in the first place is that she wanted better communication with her son and daughter-in-law because these people, her family, thought she was crazy. They couldn't understand why this woman continued to laugh and sing and cause mischief and tease and play with the children and generally cause excitement everywhere she went. So she was able to bring in her family for some family therapy and lo and behold, her family was able to come to see that she should be trying to learn from this woman instead of trying to cope with her. She had so much joy to teach them, such spiritual strength. So one time, Dr. Pearsall asked Claire what it was that made her so happy. And she said, I think the question is wrong, doctor. I keep wondering why everyone has plenty of time. I'm sorry. I keep wondering why everyone is too busy to be happy, but seems to have plenty of time to be sad. It's just in me. I love life. My motto is, what's so important you can't laugh and love? I read that and I thought, I'll tell you what's so important I can't laugh and love. If I don't keep pushing to the limit, Michelle's going to collect more Pokemon than me. <laughs> and that's called losing. So anyway, actually that is a good example of things that can prevent us from experiencing our joy in our culture. We tend to be so competitive with other people and always comparing ourselves to other people and comparing ourselves to could I have done more? So we're pushing, pushing to do more and more. See, that approach to living does not allow a lot of room for super joy in your life. Because for super joy, you need to make moments where you, you pause and you just take in the, the beauty of the universe around you. You just soak it in. You just rediscover your sense of wonder and amazement. That is part of the super joyful lifestyle, right there. Now, I'm in favor of hard work. Absolutely, I am in favor of hard work. There's also something called balance, or so I've heard. So we might think about that. Dr. Pearsall says that many people have what he calls a Captain Ahab complex. Captain Ahab was the captain of the ship in the book Moby Dick. And Captain Ahab had one obsession that dominated every waking moment of his life. He was obsessed with seeking revenge on the great white whale, Moby Dick. And this obsession was so great that it squeezed out all other parts of his life and it certainly, this obsession squeezed out any possibility of real joy or happiness. And in the end, this obsession killed him. And just like Captain Ahab, if our obsession consumes us too much, it can bring us down as well. Probably not in such a dramatic fashion as Captain Ahab, but nevertheless, it can be our undoing. And so, if, well, well, what does a Captain Ahab complex look like? Well, it can be about any major issue in your life. It can be about your job or jobs. It could be about a problem with your children or your family. It could be a health problem. It could be any issue that has the potential to consume us if we let it. So, if you have a problem that you think about day in and day out, even when you're busy doing other things, you might have a Captain Ahab complex. If you almost always view everything in your life in terms of your problem, considering your problem before you make plans or do anything for yourself, you very well could have a Captain Ahab complex. Uh, there's a, a whole questionnaire in here. I'm not going to do the whole thing.
But let's say we think we have a, a budding Ahab complex. How can we, what, what can we do about this? Well, Dr. Pearsall tells us there's only one cure for Captain Ahab complex, and it's not Dramamine. No, it's not. It is, get this, letting go of the problem. Who saw that coming? I didn't. I did not. So now some of you may be thinking, hey, I have real world problems that are demanding, that are difficult, that need my time and attention in the real world. I'm not just going to stick my head in the sand and pretend my problems aren't there. And that, Dr. Pearsall and I agree with you completely. You should not ignore your problems. You shouldn't pretend they're not there. You should do what's necessary for functioning, for daily functioning. However, no matter how difficult and demanding your problem is, you can fulfill those physical necessary actions without letting the problem consume you. You can let go of the problem at the emotional level. You can let go of your great white whale just as Claire let go of hers. Claire was in a concentration camp and she let go of her white whale and she found freedom and joy, quite a bit of it, in that camp. And we all know that when we get a major shot of joy, it transforms the way we perceive everything in our life. It's like uh, maybe your neighbor's dog barks at you every day and it drives you up a wall. Then you get a major shot of joy and you think, ah, their dog is saying hi to me. It's such a wonderful dog, so sweet. But no, our joy transforms the way we see everyone and everything around us. So, for me, and I am speaking for myself here, I find that if I do at least a little bit of my spiritual practice every day, it makes it much easier to be in contact with my joy. I, uh, I would say that just as we have a physical self, an emotional self, and a mental self, we have a spiritual self that also needs nurturing. Our spiritual self is our, our connection to higher spiritual qualities, our, our sense of oneness with each other, with the world, with the universe. It has the potential to be a great sense of peace and bliss. But if we don't feed our spiritual self, it will wither and deteriorate, just as our physical self will wither if we don't feed it. Try going a few weeks without food and see how your physical self is doing. Not going to be good. So just as we feed our physical self every day, we need to feed our spiritual self every day as well. At least that's what works for me. Austin, our very own Austin McNew, who's not present at the moment, but you all know him, uh, he put it much better than I can. So a couple weeks ago in the newsletter, he wrote this message to us. Austin writes, Dear Unity Friends, The stresses of the day can be many clientele with many requests, juggling multiple tasks, and the ever-present to-do list. Sometimes you just want to put everything on pause. Lately I've been thinking a lot about how nice it is to center myself in the heart space. I take a few minutes over my lunch hour to turn the lights off, sit down, and simply focus on my breath. I'll say a short prayer and enjoy the silence. It's amazing what a difference it makes in the rest of my day. I encourage you to take a few minutes to center yourself and see how the rest of your day feels. Blessings to you, Austin. Now I know that some of you are saying I don't have even a few minutes to center myself, but fact is you might find some of those other responsibilities go easier, maybe more naturally and quicker if you have that centering time every day. So, um, here I am. So, one of the points that Dr. Pearsall makes is that the human brain is the largest secreting organ in the human body. 
the brain secretes a lot of psychochemicals that in turn create our moods. So there's some psychochemicals for joy, some for happiness, some for love, some for sadness and depression, some for anger and rage. And so it's probably important to, be, to think about what psychochemicals am I stimulating my brain to release right now? Now, when he started talking about psychochemicals, at first I thought he meant the chemicals that Norman, Norman Bates used. But it turns out, no, that's not what he meant. The prefix psycho means having to do with the mind. So our mind is what stimulates the chemicals, the psychochemicals to release, and it's also affected by the chemicals. And it turns out that Claire gives us a beautiful example of how she mastered controlling the psychochemicals that her brain released right there in the camp. Claire said, I could get myself excited about the simplest things. One day, I found a badge from one of the guards. It was rusted, so it was probably very old. I could just look at that badge, and for my, in my mind, it became a Star of David. I felt chills run through me, as though someone gave me a shot of something. When I got down, I would look at my star. So, if Claire can do it in a concentration camp, surely we can learn to do the same thing. Isn't that right, Mark? <laughs> oh, thank you, Mark. He almost forgot his line. I can't believe that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Not long enough. <laughs> So, in conclusion, I'd just like to say that I hope all of you join me in becoming students of abnormal joyology. Thank you. <laughs> okay.